I just wanted to start by apologizing for not being able to turn on my video. I am currently working from somewhere due to COVID with a connection that probably wouldn't give a particularly good video image. As long as you can all hear me well, then that is the main thing. Next slide, please, Izzy. Right, so we thought we would start by running you through the agenda that we have in store today. I'm going to take a few minutes at the beginning to introduce today's session, as well as the panelists who have kindly joined us today. We'll then move swiftly on to share some of the key findings from the GDC's latest report. We don't have a huge amount of time, so we obviously can't cover the whole report. So we'll focus on a few insights that we hope will give you some food for thought and go away and read the report yourselves. We will then have a brilliant opportunity to discuss some of the potential implications of our findings on the solar and last mile distribution sector more generally. We have a really diverse set of panelists who have joined to share their perspectives, who I will introduce in just a minute. And finally, we will open up to questions from all of you, the audience, so that I or the panelists can answer any questions that you might have. You can send questions throughout the webinar. To do so, just send us a message via the chat function, which you can access by clicking on that little button at the bottom of the screen that has a speech bubble by it. We're going to try and cover as many questions as we can, uh, as many questions as time will permit, but we're unlikely to be able to cover all of them. So please do reach out to us after the webinar is finished if you have any key questions that we haven't been able to cover. Finally, you'll notice that you are all on mute. That is to help reduce feedback and background noise, so please do stay on mute. And if you are tech savvy, take a moment to check how you're appearing in the participants list and change it to your name and organization if possible so that we know who is on the call. Based on the sign up sheet, we think there's a real range of attendees in the audience today, including distributors, NGOs, investors. So it's great to see that the report has appealed to quite a few different profiles so far. With that said, let's meet our panelists. Next slide, please, Izzy. So as I mentioned, we've got panelists representing various different corners of the sector today. So it'd be really interesting to hear what they have to, to say, what they think about the report's findings. And in no particular order, we have Chris Carlson joining from Verisol, where he is a technical and policy expert. Verisol is, of course, an evolution of the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Program, which supports the off-grid solar market with a comprehensive suite of different quality assurance services. And Chris, along with teams at the Certified Laboratory at the University of Nairobi, led work on some of the quality testing that we did on products from which we drew a lot of the insights in this report. Next up, we have Natalie Balk joining us, who is the Head of Projects and Partnerships at Solartech Electronics in Kenya. Solartech is a wholesaler who's been a regional leader in supplying off-grid energy solutions in East Africa since all the way back to 1985. They were also a partner on this research, facilitating all of the survey work that we actually did in Kenya. We also have Ogwal Joseph joining us, who is the founder and CEO of Agro Supply Limited, a GDC member and last mile distribution company operating in Uganda, where they deliver agricultural inputs to farmers via an innovative layaway payment system. And they're now looking to expand to solar. So it'd be really interesting to hear what a distributor perspective is on some of these findings. And last but very much not least, we have Drew Corbin joining, who is the head of performance and investment at Gogler. Gogler is, of course, a global association for the off-grid solar energy industry, which was established all the way back in 2012 and now represents over 180 members as a neutral, independent, not-for-profit industry association. We'll be hearing from our panelists a little bit later on, but if you have any questions about the findings that you would particularly like to put to any of the panelists, please send them through as we go. Next slide, Izzy. Right, so let's dive into the report. Uh, we thought we'd start with giving a bit of context about why we conducted this research in the first place. Next slide. And like all GDC initiatives, it started with conversations with our members who told us that one of the key procurement challenges that they face is identifying the right products for their businesses and the right products for their end users, which is typically products that are both high quality and affordable at the last mile. What members explained to us is that, roughly speaking, they kind of feel like they're stuck between two options. Option one is selecting a quality verified product. Now, these are products that carry high quality assurance. They come from reputable brands, but they're also typically seen as being more expensive compared to other products that are available at the last mile, which can make it difficult for distributors to develop a competitive offer. 
option two is picking non-quality verified products. This is the market that is often referred to as the gray market and with good reason, we really know very little about them. We know that some are very affordable. We know that some are poor quality. Most of all, we know that last mile distributors struggle to navigate it, to tell the good from the bad, and they're not really willing to take the risk of trying in case they end up picking a poor quality product that could have a negative impact on their end users and on the sector more broadly. There may well be products in this part of the market that are affordable and high quality in the top right of the matrix, what we call the kind of price quality sweet spot, but distributors don't really have any reliable way of figuring that out today. So we started wondering, well, what could we do to help tackle this? What could we do to help distributors identify the products that are right for them? And we thought we would start by answering two questions. Next slide. First question is, well, are there products in the top right of that matrix? Are there products that are both high quality, which we defined as being meeting the lighting global quality standards, as well as affordable, which we defined as being 25 to 50% more affordable than some of the leading quality verified products that have similar specifications. The obvious second question is, if they do exist, how do we go about identifying them? And so we developed a method to try and do that. Next slide. So to answer these questions, we developed a funneled identification and testing process. And we did this um, on non-quality verified products in Kenya in particular, in partnership with Solatech and Verisol. So we started by doing a big field survey to try and understand what non-quality verified products are already in Kenya, and in particular, which are deemed to be best selling by distributors of these products. This gave us an extensive list, which we then filtered on the base of quality and price, which we deduced from the specifications. And we were really trying to find the products that had the highest chance of being in, in this sweet spot that we had defined. The next step was to put this sample of products through some quality testing. So, as I mentioned, this is something that we did with Verisol, the experts on the topic, by putting, putting the, the products through a set of different tests defined under what's referred to as the initial screening method. These are tests that cover a range of different topics, from battery performance, to truth in advertising, to durability. And at the end of the filtered, funneled process, we ended up putting eight products through the full set of testing. Now, just to clarify, the scope of our research and all of the products that we looked at was limited to what are often referred to as Pico products. So these are products with panels under 10 watt peak in size that are sold in cash, which we find is often the case for non-quality verified products. So what did we find? Next slide. There are three key insights um, that stood out to us and that we wanted to share with you today. Next slide. The first insight is, as suspected, there is a high variety in product performance in the non-quality verified market, including some products that are actually relatively close to meeting the lighting global quality standards. So on this slide, what you will see is eight radar charts, one for each of the products that went through full testing, where we've grouped the tests into six different groups. And the gray hexagon marks where the lighting global standards would lie, the red hexagon marks where each product lies in relation to them. Essentially, the larger the area within the red um, shape, the closer the product is to meeting the standards. And what you see when you look at this is that actually none of these products, despite going through that filtered system, meet the lighting global standards today. What we don't see if we look at it purely from that perspective is that we have two products on the far right of the slide that are extremely far from the standards. They had a lot of issues around battery, very poor consumer facing information. Uh, you know, they really passed only around 40% of the tests that we put them through. We wouldn't deem these as high quality products. On the other end though, we have three products, one solar light and two multi-light systems that are relatively close to the standards. They had a few issues around consumer facing information, um, warranty was an issue for one of them. There's also some product safety labeling that would need to be tweaked. But by and large, these are considered quite close to the standards. They passed around 80% of the tests that we put them through. These were obviously the products that interested us most. We're looking for sweet spot products. So what we did once we determined what the, the level of quality was is to think 
well, what would it take to get them to the standards? What would it take to make the tweaks that are needed so that they actually come up to the level of quality that we would need? And would these changes have a significant impact on their price? These are products we knew were price competitive in the form that we took them in. What happens when, they, when we bring them up to standard? Next slide. And what we found, uh, somewhat to our surprise, is that the tweaks that are needed for these products to meet the standards would add under 5% to their free onboard price. So this is the price that the manufacturer offers before shipping. And the reason for this is, as we just mentioned, a lot of the issues that the products that are close to the standards face are around things like consumer facing information and labeling, which is relatively easy and inexpensive to change. So what we see on this slide is an example with one of the multi-light systems that was deemed close to the standards. And as we see, the tweaks needed would have a minimal impact on the product's cost and price. Once we had uh, an estimate of how much these products would cost once they were tweaked, once they were high quality, we were able to think a little bit more about what these products might look like for the end user in terms of price. We modeled how much it would cost to supply the tweaked versions of these products to last mile distributors in Kenya via a wholesaler with the after sales and the marketing support that they would need in order to make this type of product viable for them. And in turn, we estimated what end user price distributors might be able to offer. And this allowed us to see that in fact, the three products that we have identified as being close to the standards are also extremely price competitive. Next slide. So on this um, slide, there's what looks like a somewhat complex graph. Try and break it down. It's a comparison of multiple multi-light systems that we analyzed. So on the left, you have um, their price, the end user price, and on the bottom, you have their battery capacity. Battery capacity is a measure that we used as a proxy for comparison, but as you will see in the detailed report, we also tried to make sure we were comparing products with similar features, similar number of light points. The dots in black or the dark brown are quality verified products. These are ones that we didn't cherry pick. And again, the report explains our method for selecting these. So we tried to remain as objective as possible. We compared these with the two multi-light systems that are close to the standards, which are the green dots that you see, at the estimated end user price that our model suggested. In addition, you have a number of uh, dots on the graph that are other non-quality verified products that were put through our testing process, which didn't perform as well as well. What we see is that, at least in our sample, the products could in theory be distributed to end users at around half the price of quality verified comparable alternatives that are on the market today. We saw a similar trend with the solar light as well, although to a lesser extent, they had around a 25 to 35% discount. Now, this is obviously all on paper. Uh, it remains to be proven and the Global Distributors Collective is hoping to do that by running a pilot on the ground with SolarTech, whereby we would import and distribute these products. What it suggests though is quite an exciting finding, quite an exciting opportunity for the sector. What it looks like is that there are products out there that are seemingly well placed to respond to end users and distributors needs. These products can be high quality and sold at competitive prices. And we can identify them via something like the funneled process that we described earlier. Our third finding, though, is that customers and distributors aren't necessarily choosing to purchase these products over others. Next slide. So there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between what we're seeing our best selling products that customers are buying today in Kenya and what our own testing and research showed. Now, many of the best-selling products in our sample, as we've just seen, are very far from meeting the lighting global standards. Similarly, we have no evidence to suggest that the three sweet spot products have completely swept the Kenyan market or any other market for that matter. And there are a lot of reasons why that might be the case. Possibly distributors and end users struggle to identify quality in the non-quality verified market. They have no kind of markers or indicators that would help them navigate that. 
They might have also developed lower expectations of quality over the years compared to what we define in the light and global standards. It's possible that they've seen so many products that are poor quality that they've drawn the conclusion that that's just the norm for the sector and they will probably have to buy a new product within six months. Other hypotheses are that they choose price over anything else, price over quality. They would prefer to purchase something that is much more affordable today, even if it means replacing it in a few months time. These at the moment are just hypotheses and they require a lot more research and discussion in order for us to really figure out why it is that we're seeing this disconnect between customer purchasing patterns and the products that we think seem to respond best to their needs. Luckily, we have just the people to discuss that. And as that brings us to the end of the presentation of key findings, up next, we are going to move on to our panel discussion. So, as I was mentioning earlier, we've got lots of really different perspectives with us today. And I'm, I'm curious to start with Natalie and Ogwell as the pr practitioners in the group. As we've just seen, the report suggests that there are products out there that are high quality and affordable, but end users and last mile distributors are struggling to identify them. Ogwal and Natalie, does this resonate with what you've seen in Uganda and Kenya? What are some of the challenges that you or your end users have faced in trying to find the solar products that best meet your customers' needs and wants? Ogwal, let's start with you. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, th uh, that is really true. Uh, I work with a lot of farmers in Uganda. Uh, we started in 2017, and right now we have about uh, 10,000 smaller farmers that we are working with. And all these farmers are using uh, the new innovation that we have introduced, the layaway system to use payment as to the response of taking things on credit. Uh, we have seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of quality products in the market, uh, even agricultural inputs, even, even seeds, so many seed companies producing very good seeds. But when you go to the bottom of the pyramid, you don't find them there. Uh, when we started doing a pilot, uh, uh, when we started doing a pilot with solar system, uh, the, our layaway system with solar, solar system, where farmers could make payment uh, for solar lights or solar kits using the layaway system, we really struggle a lot to look for a legit and um, uh, a, a cost-friendly product. Uh, there are so many, yet there are so many solar companies in Uganda. So I think the game is kind of determined by uh, which organization or which company has the highest uh, uh, money for marketing. Uh, those are the people that people know at the bottom of the pyramid. It doesn't matter if their product is, is fake, not good, but so long as they have the money to market and go out there and go down there, automatically people at the bottom of the pyramid will know about it. But good products that are not marketed properly does not reach smaller farmers, yet some of them are actually not expensive in comparison to what is going there. And this, are, this is some of the things that we as distributors, as a growth supply we are trying to do at the moment, is to make sure that we source, we be the high and the years of farmers who are down there and customers who are looking for legit products at the bottom of the pyramid. We just be in conference in webinar and meet people who make products like this and use research like these ones to actually pinpoint the exact product that are of high quality value and then take to the bottom of the pyramid and promote them there instead of just getting something which is cheaper and try to force our customers to take it because you have not done a lot of research. So like you have said, what everything that you have said here resonates with what is going on, even here in Uganda. Great, thanks, Ogwell. And like you say, last mile distributors have a, a role and almost a responsibility to get the products that would best respond to cons consumer needs to the consumers themselves. And I think in a similar way, Natalie, you're kind of one step up in the value chain. And a lot of the time, your customers are the dis distributors themselves. So what has your experience been when working with these distributors and the challenges that they face in finding what they want? Um, yes, I mean, through, through this report you know, and, and through this whole process, it's been very interesting to, 
to see because this still the market is really dynamic. It's really dynamic in Kenya and East Africa. Um, and this is what Ogwell is saying as well with new entries coming in. There's a lot of market players um, and there's a lot of new last mile distributors coming in. So Ogwell is coming from the agriculture sector um, and there's others that are coming from different sectors, not just the solar sector. So we've seen our own um, distributor network change as well. We've added new distributors instead of sticking to original um, electrical engineering, uh, uh, wholesaler and electrical shops, that type of thing. We're seeing distributors like Ogwa with agricultural goods as well, which means that identifying products becomes even more difficult because they're not coming from a technical base. Um, and then we're going into markets that have no experience with uh, so the products or no expectation for um, honoring warranties or after sales support, that type of thing. Um, so you do see that a lot of distributors as well as end users um, have lower expectations of what required, which means that the price point is, is, has to match that expectation so it drops mid lower further. Um, and then with, with Solitech as a company, we found it quite difficult to identify um, products that meet that, even coming from a technical background. And we went the safe route, whereas we have always sort of studied with quality products whether they're Lighting Global certified or Verisol certified products. Um, and, and from that now, we've seen that the expansion of this gray market and a lot more products coming in and a changing dynamic in, this, in, this, well, in, in the solar lantern market in general. Um, but how do we test all of these products? How do we identify which one is the best one? And how do we know that that is actually serving um, our, our distributors needs and then our end user needs? So yeah, this is a very timely report to sort of tackle these issues and explore the gray market. Right, and I think that what both Abul and Natalie were saying there um, kind of matches something that we found in the report, which is that a lot of the best selling products in Kenya, the, the products that are really appealing um, are, are cheap, sure, but might also be low in quality. Uh, and that's what we also saw in our own quality testing. And like we just said, there's a number of different reasons why it, that might be the case, that they're choosing those type of products that aren't featuring particularly well um, when compared with our quality standards. Chris, in your opinion, what are the type of tools and programs that the sector should be developing, or even amending tools that already exist, to ensure that both end users and distributors are really empowered to find the products that they want that serve their needs and make informed choices? I mean, uh, as the standards and policy guy, it's probably no surprise to the participants that I'm going to say that uh, our QA framework that has been developed over the past several years is really the best foundation that we have uh, as a sector to build upon. Uh, so the IEC test methods and standards are a way to promote international harmonization of markets. So when, when governments set standards and, and programs set standards for quality, uh, we're all aiming at the same target. Uh, so that's, that's the first and, and foremost thing that, that we're working with here. Uh, secondly, I want to also plug what, what Verisol has been doing over the years in, in supporting that development of that framework. We have a product certification uh, format that uh, has several benefits. We uh, promote testing of products um, random sampling of the, the product samples to avoid golden samples and uh, accounting for variability among the products. Uh, as part of the Verisol certification of products, uh, we do market surveillance testing as well as requiring renewal testing of the certification every two years. Um, so all this to say that when um, a stakeholder sees Verisol certification, they can have much more confidence in the product and also realize that there are many tangible benefits uh, to the user when, when, they, when they choose a, a Verisol certified product. Uh, I also wanna plug that uh, we have a newly enhanced product database. Uh, we'll have a webinar on September 17th, giving everyone a tour of that. Everyone can, the public can access uh, detailed information about uh, product performance and quality and get an understanding of what products are out there 
uh, what services they provide, et cetera. We also have a lot of technical notes which uh, provide resources on how to design, develop, and distribute promoting high quality off-grid solar solutions. Uh, adding upon that, there's a, a network of accredited test labs. So in the case of, of companies that aren't really sure if a product they're exploring is, is gonna meet their needs or if it's gonna be good quality, there uh, is an initial screening method test, similar to what was done for this study, that anyone can pay a laboratory to do. It's fairly inexpensive and quick. It allows you to get an idea of the likelihood of a product meeting the standards. Uh, so, so really, what I would say in response to that question, Amy, is that uh, we do have a lot of tools. We have a lot of resources and uh, a framework that can be built upon. So when we have countries adopting harmonized standards and we have pro uh, programs using the, the same standards, then if those standards are well implemented and enforced, uh, the market will contain primarily good quality products that meet standards. Thanks, Chris. Um, and actually, what I want to come back a bit later on to what you were mentioning about this product database, because um, although it wasn't the focus of our research and our report, we actually found some products that already carry the certification and that based on our definitions are in the sweet spot, but that are still relatively unknown by distributors. So it feels like there's even more kind of promotion and matchmaking that needs to be done to make sure that the products and the distributors find themselves. Before we think about that, um, I just wanted to think a little bit more about uh, the, the manufacturers behind these products. I mean, one of the really brilliant things to come out of this, the, the good news is that we know it's now technically possible to produce quality products at much lower prices than we expected to see. And the three sweet spot products that we identified are all manufactured by manufacturers that focus exclusively on designing and manufacturing products. They don't do anything else. They're typically based in China. Um, they're, they're the profile that has historically been associated with more price competitive products. And that's not necessarily a profile that we're all actively engaging with all of the time in um, our, our different programs. Uh, Drew, I know Gogler has already started engaging them. I wonder if you have any ideas on how we, we work with more of these manufacturers who we know can make price competitive products to help them bring up the quality uh, and make sweet spot products. And if we do that, you know, what are the implications from some, for some of the other players, the more integrated suppliers that are often referred to as first generation, who have products that are deemed slightly more premium in price? Yeah, thanks very much, Amy. Uh, it's great to be on the call today and speak to GDC members in the audience. I think I'll, before I answer the question, I'd, I'd like to speak a bit more generally on the topic of kind of affordability and quality and offer a, a slightly different perspective. Um, I mean, clearly for low income customers, the, the price tag is a key part of their purchase decision, um, but price is not the be all and end all. And, Google does a, a lot of surveys. We've um, spoken to thousands of, of customers in the last year or so. Um, and what comes up repeatedly is that customers value product durability and after sales service. So they're asking, you know, will the product last? And if it breaks, can I get it repaired or, or replaced? Um, so I think with durability, it's kind of easy to fall into the trap that thinking all various all certified products are, you know, the same standard. But actually, we, you know, we see a great range in terms of their, their features, their performance, their durability. Um, you know, for example, the, the standard requires a, a two-year warranty, but uh, you know, we see some have got a design life of you know, five to seven years. You know, you know, branded companies will offer you know, after-sales service that consists of call centers, train technicians, spare parts, logistics, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, the, we see the brand leaders, you know, they, they follow this holistic strategy based on maximizing the, the total cost of ownership, you know, with the aim to deliver value, build trust and um, convert every single sale into a, into a lifetime customer. Um, so yeah, my, my point is, you know, I think we want to avoid the, the trap of oversimplifying it by looking at price and, you know, think, um, you know, more holistic, holistically about, um, 
you know, lifetime value for, for customers and trust in the technology. Um, saying that, you know, there are different business strategies and, you know, we, we believe in, um, that there is, you know, a role for these, um, for these value products for, for, you know, low cost competitive products. And, you know, you look at the incumbents and they've got high overheads with, you know, big, big footprints, large R and D departments, et cetera. And, you know, I think there is a scope for, um, you know, a new generation of, um, you know, um, of products and distribution models that can still add value for, uh, for customers. So uh, to finally uh, get onto your question of, you know, how do we engage more, more manufacturers to produce quality verified products at, at affordable prices? Um, I mean, as, as you suggested just then, you know, the, the good news is this is already happening to, to some extent. And we, we've, we're seeing a, a new generation of Chinese manufacturers that sell quality verified products. Um, Notably, um, you know, there's Shenzhen Lemmy, Solar Run, Poly Solar, um, and you can go on the, the Verisol website and, you know, search the, the, the products and the, the manufacturers. Um, as Chris said, they've got a new website and product database. I, it's fantastic. I encourage everyone to, to check it out. Um, and a growing number of these companies are also um, Gogla members, and you can find them on our, our membership page. Uh, we now have um, eight uh, members uh, that are Chinese manufacturers, so about 5% of our, our membership. And you know, I think that signals a shift that they are you know, looking towards this, um, this sector with kind of increased professionalism and looking to you know, tap into um, the, the networks that we're all kind of operating in. Um, and I know that the IFC has um, had a, a program to engage these these companies uh, to, to raise awareness of the, the standards and, and the opportunities. And as the Lighting Global program winds down, I think we all need to think about how we can continue that good work. Um, you know, embrace, embracing these these companies in projects like like this. And you know, I'd love to see more of them um, uh, align, um, become a Google member. So I think we need to, to think about a push in, in that way as well. Um, and um, we, we've talked about um, you know organising a, a matchmaking event, a online matchmaking event between manufacturers and distributors. Um, it'd be great for, um, as we've discussed, for Google and GDC to to hook up and, and think about that. Um, curious if any of the attendees today think that would be would be valuable. Um, yeah, drop it in the chat or send us a direct message. That'd be good to hear. Um, so yeah. Maybe in summary, I'd say, you know, we, we welcome more manufacturers, more products. You know, we think competition is, is good for customers, for choice and for, for, for price reductions. But a, a race to the bottom on pricing is, is not what we want. You know, it's, it's going to hurt customers and, and hold us back on these energy access targets. Um, so, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to, you know, think um, and ensure that customers are protected if and when products fail and we look beyond price to, to quality, service, and value. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Um, like you say, I think it, it's exciting to see that some of these manufacturers are already joining the structures and using the platforms that are already in place, including Gogler and the Verisol database. Like you also mentioned, um, there's kind of more to be done to bring in some of the players that aren't currently engaging with those and to make the, the tools that we have more effective at matching them with the distributors, like you just mentioned. And yes, it'd be brilliant to hear from more GDC members and the general audience today if you think that would be useful, if you have any other ideas on how we might do that. I think Ogwell, given that you're kind of representing a lot of GDC members today um, as a panelist, be curious to hear what you think the sector might be able to do to match you up with more of these manufacturers that we're discovering can make the type of products that might serve your needs. Uh, okay, so we, we, we are still new in the solar space uh, and I'm really uh, thankful for this event to really kind of know all distributors and uh, people in the solar space and uh, manufacturers and so on. Because one thing that was really constraining me is where am I going to get a good product from? Uh, although we have innovated a good payment platform, 
because one thing that really brought us into solar, into distributing solar, is uh, the need by the farmers that we have been serving, who have been using our layaway system to pay for agricultural inputs. And at the same time, these farmers were working with different uh, solar companies, making payment for solar system using a pay-go model. And they kind of think that the layaway system works better than the, 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 the pay-go pay system because the pay-go system, it never stops. It's kind of expensive. And once they miss the payment, I think the power kind of goes off. So these farmers have been saying, these things doesn't actually look as expensive as they think. How about they use the, the, the layaway system to pay for these uh, solar lights and they own it. The only, the only thing that the solar companies would do is offer after sales services if uh, uh, solar lights break down or something like that. And that is why we came into the solar space. We did a test in 2019, that was uh, last year, with 30 farmers. Uh, interestingly, all these farmers, we gave them a period of four, a period of four months to make payment for, for solar system. Interestingly, all these farmers finished their payment within a period of two to three months, which was really interesting and motivating. Now, we have been looking for a way. Uh, how can we source for the best, uh, for the best uh, solar, solar kits? Because one of the mandates at Agro Supply is that we want to make sure that we supply people or customers at the bottom of the pyramid with the best product ever and the best innovative way to pay for it. And that is why even, even the seed, the inputs that we're doing, we tried inputs here in Uganda. We found out that they are not actually good. They are germinating 80%, 70%. That doesn't meet the standard. That's why we went to Nairobi to import seeds from Kenya. That is germinating up to 99%, 98%, something which is good. The same thing we want it to happen with, uh, with, with the solar system. We don't want to break our record at the bottom of the pyramid that a gross supply has supplied uh, a solar system that got broken within a few weeks or within a few months. We want farmers to use this, something durable and also cost effective. Now, these are, the, these are the kind of platforms that we can get these manufacturers or distributors or people with solar system. And these are the kind of reports that we can actually really use to determine that this product is legit. This is how you know a good solar product and this is how you know effects on a product. So the matchmaking that that gentleman was talking about is really good. But still, if you match make me with a, a manufacturer from China or from another part of the world, I'm still going to apply the techniques which is in this report to make sure that I get the best product from the best manufacturer. I think uh, <clears throat> we have about three, about three manufacturers or suppliers or distributors at the moment that we're trying to see, to test and see if their products are good. But we're also open to working with other people who feel like their product is good. One thing that I'm open to, since we're doing a lot of things, and uh, one of the constraints that we have been getting, which, which is actually highlighted in this report, is the time, the time we uh, distributors spend in getting this product across the border. So one thing that I want is, if we're going to work with any solar company, I think they should take up that time because we're spending a lot of time in importing agricultural inputs. If we spend a lot of time in importing solar, and then we're going to spend a lot of our time in importing products. So if we can have a solar company that gets product up to Uganda, or we find a makeable way how we can ship it immediately to Uganda, that will really be interesting. Because with inputs, it disturbed us a lot until a growth supply and a seed company had to sit down and find a makeable way on how this input can really move quickly from Nairobi to Uganda. So that is one thing also that is costing a lot of people here, a lot of distributors, and that is one thing that is making them hike up the price of products at the bottom of the pyramid because importation of products reaching the border, those guys are crazy. They will take you around, ask for a lot of money, a lot of bribe, and so on. And at the end of it all, the distributor will have the price and this will go into the, what? the, the, the customers at the last mile. So I don't want that to happen with, uh, with the solar, with the solar lights also. Thanks, Agwal. It's, it's interesting because if I understand correctly, um, you said that you still really value testing the products yourself. That's something that you're currently doing with a series of different products. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting opportunity to kind of learn more about how these products perform in the field, which is something that you will be seeing and that we were, might not have actually seen um, in lab conditions in the same way. Um, you also said that one of the key challenges once you've found the right products is getting it to where you're operating in a way that is affordable. Uh, Natalie, 
this might be a place that a wholesaler might play a role as an intermediary. Do you have any thoughts on what else we could be doing in the sector, including what wholesalers themselves could be doing to match distributors with the right products and do so in a way that is affordable? Um, yes, I mean, like, uh, like what Drew touched on, as well as Agwal, um, this shouldn't be a race to the bottom in terms of price. Um, that's, I don't think what the, the aim of this report was, but what we need to find is like the name of the report, the sweet spot, the balance between offering really quality, affordable products with an after sales care um, and honoring warranties, because that is obviously important to customers uh, no matter where they are, whether they're bottom of the pyramid or whether they're um, at the top of the pyramid. And also quality products that are um, affordable price into the different areas that we're going. So what we're looking at, I think, is a, a, a shift in potentially some of the uh, value chains of how the solar market was working before, because we've got such a, a variety of new entries in different industries, like Ogwell from uh, agricultural, is that we can look at wholesalers now as filling in um, these gaps or even removing some of these barriers. And this is what SolarTech is really looking at. If SolarTech can offer the after sales care and, and offer the warranties and try and remove these logistical barriers that companies like Ogwell face, remove the financial barriers, because with working with a lot of these manufacturers out of China or India, you're paying upfront and you're paying upfront uh, for a large amount of products because they'll have minimum order quantities. So if local distributors or local wholesalers can um, be that sort of middle point and help uh, the smaller last mile distributors get the right products at the right price um, in and to all of their end users, we have a much more sustainable value chain building there. And it's involving additional companies and it's involving a lot of local companies as well. So you will, you will see that, um, you know, we will be more likely to be able to offer companies, um, GDC members like Ogwell, better payment terms and faster deployment of products and on-ground offer sales care. Um, and I think that's sort of a, a replicable solution that we could do in other places as well. Um, and then that, that also ties into helping uh, ensure that there's quality because for our wholesaler, if we're putting and honoring after sales, we're not going to want products that are bad quality either. We're not going to bring bad quality products into the marketplace. Um, we're going to make sure that they are meeting all of the standards um, because otherwise it's our name and it's our, our expense if we're getting lots of products back on our warranties and things like that. Um, so I do think that it's, it's, there's very interesting things that we can test here and see if these are different ways that we can now solve or remove the barriers that I think a lot of GDC members are facing, but not only identifying the products, but actually getting them to market. Um, and selling them, like Agua was saying, and, and opening up this, this gray market so that it's a bit more transparent about what products fit where and consumers then are getting the best. They're both getting the, the, the quality uh, products and they're also getting it at, at affordable prices. Right, thanks Natalie. And like you were saying there, we've sort of developed a, a way of finding these products now that could potentially be replicated um, including in other sectors so if there are if there's anyone in the audience that isn't particularly focused on solar but who could see a potential replication of any of what we've discussed in other sectors and um, it'd be great to hear about that in the chat and keep on sending any questions that you might have for the panel or for ourselves the group that put together the report that said the the approach that we outlined in the report to find these products is brilliant at kind of seeing what is already there today, what's in the market today. Uh, but the market, the technology available, what customers want, it's constantly evolving. And we need to somehow keep up to date with how this is developing in order to make sure that the products that we are looking for, identifying, making available, are the ones that are going to respond to customer requirements at that given time. I'm curious to hear from everyone on the panel on what sort of feedback loops, if any, you think are currently in place that allow distributors, end users and manufacturers to communicate what it is that they want and what's available at the moment. 
And I'm especially curious to hear if you think there are any inefficiencies in those feedback loops that we could improve and how. Chris, keen to hear what you have to say about this. Uh, again, I think uh, we could improve the level of outreach uh, among several of the stakeholder groups. For example, uh, figuring out how we can uh, participate in a process of uh, informing last mile distributors uh, such as such as Ogwell um, and understand what their clients are looking for uh, and also inform them about the resources that are available uh, you know if if uh, we can target those groups and actually get them to see our database uh, I think they can make much more informed decisions because they're the ones who are having those direct engagements with the uh, uh, with the consumers. Um, I also just wanted to flag up something um, that I thought of when when Drew was talking that there I, I don't want to promote some kind of misconception about these sweet spot products. Um, it's important to acknowledge that the the quality verified products um, which which you can see on the on our database uh, are very diverse in terms of, of form, function, and and price point. Um, so I think Amy, you flagged that up too. Um, so you know perhaps uh, there could be some sort of uh, better tool or means of communicating uh, that diversity of the products and and be able to relay that to the to the groups that need that information. Thanks, Chris. Does anyone else on the panel have any thoughts of this? Drew, you know, you're the one who is obviously engaging a lot with manufacturers who are a key part of this feedback loop. What have you seen operating and how do you think it could work better? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, for me, in terms of innovation, um, I see the, the lighting and phone charging product, products as being relatively mature. You know, they're kind of fundamental energy services and you know the the products have kind of re reached a maturity in terms of you know how they how they work their form factor etc um not to say that they, they won't evolve but you know I, i'm not expecting massive changes there to be honest i think where the real interesting innovation is coming is around the the customer engagement and that particularly last mile customers um you know thinking about the the marketing, um, the the sales, the after sales, distribution, the finance. Um, so yeah, what what Natalie and Ogwell were talking about in terms of their 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 innovations on you know aggregating um, and you know finding interesting partnerships to you know ensure that the the, the finance and, and and the after sales is right. I think to me is where the the real interest comes. Um, and yeah, the, the customer feedback loops will be will be all important. Um, and you know, I think that a lot of it is about you know maximizing your your engagements with customers. So you know, getting out to and speaking to people, you know, with your sales agent network, with your call centers, with with surveys, um, and also um, you know, I think there's a, a data element here. You know, being really um, you know rigorous in terms of collecting and, and analyzing data. Um, at an individual and portfolio level to, to see what's what's working and, and what can be improved. Thanks, Drew. And you're right. I mean, I think it's all about trying to find ways to listen and interact with customers. And Ogwell, I think of everyone here today, you're probably the one who's doing this uh, most, you know, in terms of the end users who are actually using the products. What are some of the forums or the, the mechanisms that you have to discuss the type of products and services that your customers are looking for? And then how do you feed that back to the relevant people to make sure that you can find those products? Interesting question. So uh, <clears throat> some, of the, some of the things that we are doing, because for us to, for us to enroll a farmer to make payment for, uh, for a solar system is that we need to educate them and see their need. Uh, I've seen a lot of solar companies, uh, distributors and so on, go into the community and they're trying to sell their best moving product. That is not how things are supposed to work at the bottom of the pyramid. You're supposed to really 
dive deep and see what do these farmers really want. Uh, we, 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 went, we went down there with a, a couple of products. Others look really fancy, others look really small, others look medium. But I have seen the way people at the bottom of the pyramid uh, do their selections. Most of the products that were going were products that have things that they need. Not only lighting, products that have radio options and phone charging options, those ones were going. Most of the products that only have lighting options, they were not selecting. Uh, uh, but yet, some companies are promoting those ones more. I don't know for what reason, uh, but let's learn to listen to, uh, to customers at the bottom of the pyramid uh, and, try to, and try to do this, try to give products according to what they want, other than pushing uh, things that we have as companies and so on. So some of, the, some of the criteria that we take farmers through before we enroll them for, for the layaway system, at the start of the, uh, before they start making the payment, is put all the products on the table and uh, tell them exactly the description, uh, how the products look like, the kind of what they have and so on. They used the modification and those kind of things. Let them know. Uh, another thing that, that these, farm, these people at the bottom of the pyramid are always asking is years of warranty. Uh, most of these companies don't actually follow these criteria. They just give you the product, they don't tell you there's a warranty, and they will never come back, they will never even call you. Uh, those are some of the few things that, that we have been telling these, uh, these people. And secondly, the company that we are going to engage with, I even told you guys last time, is that we want them to increase uh, the, how, the year of warranty from two at least to three years. Because I've seen these, these people are using this solar system. It doesn't get spoiled within one year or within two years but immediately it surpasses two years. The warranty is over. That means that they have to pay for repairs and those kind of thing. Yet, if, if, uh, if a farmer is using a layaway system, they're paying a full amount of this product and honing, it, and honing it. So why can we extend, why can we extend the years of warranty so we can extend the, what? the service to them in an in affordable way so they can still use that, their solar system for a, a small period of time. So, if we take the farmers, the, these people throughout all this, uh, looking at different products, and then now it comes, what are the prices for different products before they start paying for it? What's the price of a product that has a radio, a radio compared to the price of a product that doesn't have a radio? What's the product, price of a product that has a solar, uh, that has a panel that needs to be put on top of your roof compared to the one that has, that has a radio? Now, if you're to see, uh, one product that we, the product that we went with was from uh, Green Planet. And uh, one of the products that farmers really like was uh, a product that has a light option where they can move with it around. They can unplug it, then move with it around from one house to another. And that same product has a, a, a charging port where they can charge their phone as well as listen to a local radio station. Those are some of the things that farmers were selecting in response to putting a solar panel on top of their house and so on. So these are some of the things that we take uh, 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 these people through before they, they select the product. And then now it comes to honoring their wish. Before we give them that this product is this amount of money and this is your, your payment goal, so you need to start paying now and it'll take you like maybe three, four months for you to finish paying it. We need to honor their wish. Let them take exactly the product that they have taken. Don't try to divert their attention. Most of the, these solar companies, Try to divert your attention. Even me, who is knowledgeable, I went to buy solar system. I know exactly the kind of product I wanted. I, I actually went straight to that company and told them, I want this product. This product is good for me. They try to divert my attention, giving me something else, something which is more expensive. Yet, I really didn't want. I told them, I'm, I, I don't want this and so on. And then, surprisingly, I went with ready cash. I wanted to buy it with cash. These companies wanted me to enroll me in a pay mod. I was like, so why do you guys, why do you guys want to promote company interest more than the people who are using the product? I came with a real high deal uh, uh, a problem and a typical solution that I want this product. I have my ready cash money to pay for it. First of all, you're diverting my, my attention from that. And then you want me to pay using a pay go model. Yet I don't want. Then we had to hide it. Then I had to pay. I paid like twice. I paid for it twice. And I even had the money cash. So one thing that distributors were going to the bottom of the pyramid, were going to last mile. They should know is that please. I know these people are not so much educated, and you might try to take advantage of advantage of them, but honor their wishes. Explain this to these people in a real local language, be it in Kiswahili, in what language in any country you're in. 
explain this to these people, let them understand that this solar is like this, like this, this product is like this, it's used in this kind of way, and then give them something that is, that is beneficial to them, not beneficial to you only. If you guys can have this relationship, they automatically will distribute more units. Thanks, Ogwell. That sounds like a, yeah, a very frustrating experience. Um, but I think that it's, it's a good note to uh, start ending on because you're right. I mean, the, the key thing is listening to the customer, engaging with the customer, understanding what they want and finding the ways that we as a sector can try to mobilize the right players to make those available. I see that we're coming towards the end of our time. Uh, so I wanted to start by just saying a huge thank you to all of the panelists and everyone who joined us today. The webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the Global Distributor Collective website after, well, I think it'll probably be within the next coming weeks. If you have any follow-up questions, clarifications, please do reach out by writing to us on the email that is now appearing on your screen. Thank you, Izzy. We hope you found the webinar useful and insightful and that it's encouraged you to go and read the full report and share it with anyone in your network you think might find it useful. Thanks a lot and we hope to speak to you all soon.